All right. If, if everyone can hold out their hands, catch some bubble gum, unwrap it, chomp it up, put in your mouth, chew it, blow a huge bubble. All right. Very good. Can we take a deep breath really quickly? So we make sure our oxygen is in our brain because we are going to race to make sure that we get through all of this good practical information for you guys and present it hopefully in a way that makes sense. How are we doing so far? Pretty good? All right, we're, we're understanding how our brain works. We've got that foundation laid. Now we're gonna move into what we're here for, talking about those specific social and emotional teaching strategies. Um, where we're gonna get a lot of the information from today is the California Preschool Learning Foundations. Who here is familiar with these foundations if you teach in early childhood? Okay, great. Um, so the California Preschool Learning Foundations, for those of you who are not aware, are the standards that the state has set about what we want the children to be, to be able to accomplish at any given age. Now there's an infant toddler set of standards, and then of course we have our common core state standards for kindergarten through eighth grade. Kindergarten through eighth grade does not yet have social and emotional skills standards. Although, raise your hand if you think they should develop standards and objectives for kindergarten through eighth grade. Okay, so because because they don't yet have them, you guys after this presentation can write them. We'll, we'll do a group work session. Uh, maybe Dr. Vidari can arrange that. We'll write the state objectives for them. Um, we're going to kind of look at that mid range of threes to fours, um, threes to fours to fives actually, and see what the objectives are for them and then you can kind of tailor down a little bit for infant toddler or tailor up for kinder for a second. All right, the California Preschool Learning Foundations are the what we need to do with the students. Oh, sorry, it just exited out of my show. Be nice, computer. All right, the preschool curriculum framework is more details on how we do that with our students. Just in case you're not familiar and haven't seen them, in the back of your packet, I think, it, I think it's the second to the last page, you have a list of one of the California Preschool Learning Foundations relating to social and emotional skills. It's the foundation on self and self-awareness, which we're going to talk about in just a second. I just wanted you to be able to see what information they provide so they've got the Objective 1.1, describe their physical characteristics, behavior, and abilities. Then they go into more detail about what that looks like in, in the classroom. And then they give you examples of what that behavior looks like on a day-to-day -day basis and some examples so you can see whether or not the students in your class are meeting those objectives. That's just so you can see that. These are all of the social and emotional learning foundations. For the sake of time, we're not able to go through each one of these. Who would be interested in doing an all-day interactive workshop, though, where we could delve into these? Raise your hand if you would want to do that. Here at Biola, I, I need to see your hands higher so David can see it and let us do an all-day 10-hour cram session. No, I'm just kidding, not 10 hours, but I'd love for us to be able to delve more into these. But just so you can kind of see, the state has divided these categories into self, social interaction relationships. Under self, we have self-awareness, self-regulation, social and emotional understanding, empathy and caring, and initiative and learning. For social interaction, we have interactions with familiar adults, with peers, group participation, cooperation, and responsibility. And then with relationships, there are standards for attachments to parents, close relationships with teachers and caregivers, and friendships. So really good objectives for us to be working towards in our classroom. Really quickly, I'd like for you to brainstorm with your family, though, or with your family. Your table's now your family. Aw, I want you to brainstorm with your table some strategies that you could use to teach the concept of rhyming, because we're going to kind of shift our paradigm about the way we think of social and emotional skills. A lot of times, we often think that children should enter into the classroom knowing how to sit down, interact cooperatively with friends, share toys. Um, if you're a new teacher, you might think that happens right away. Uh, veteran teachers, we know that it takes time, but we want to talk about how can we intentionally teach to those. So you guys are going to take three minutes, brainstorm with your table. What are strategies that you would use to teach the concept of rhyming? So you have students in your classroom, you want them to learn how to rhyme. What are some things that you would do? All right, who would like to share? We'll just take three ideas. What's something you would use maybe to teach the concept of rhyming?
to our students. Anyone have one they want to share? Yes. What was it? Singing, songs. Who uses songs to teach a concept of rhyming? Yeah, that's a great strategy. Another one? Nursery rhymes. That's great. Finger plays, that rhyming and nursery rhymes. How about another one? Yes. Flannel stories. So utilizing those flannel stories, showing them different words that rhyme with pictures, right? How about Dr. Seuss books? Is that a strategy we'd use? So books, songs, games, the point being that when we're trying to teach students a new skill, we're going to do so in lots of different ways. Like Dr. Vidari mentioned, children have different learning styles. We want to make sure we're taking that multi-sensory approach. So we're not just going to present it in one way and then walk away from it. We're going to present it in multiple ways so that our students can really get that information. And we also know some of our students are going to pick up the concept of rhyming right away. And others of our students are going to take a little bit longer and more intent and more maybe one-on-one -on -one support. It's the same thing with social and emotional skills, objectives, and standards. Some of our students are going to get it right away, and some of our students are going to need that additional help and support. I love this quote. We'll read it together, um, and it's just to kind of help us get in that paradigm um, and that mindset of looking at social and emotional skills, not as a behavior, but as a skill set that we can help our children acquire. We'll read it together on the count of three. One, two, three. If a child doesn't know how to read, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to swim, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to multiply, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to drive, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to behave, we punish, teach. It's harder to finish that last sentence, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we can finish that and say, if a child doesn't know how to behave, we teach. We teach them the skill sets that they need, the skills that they need to be successful. And that's what we're going to do right now, figure out how we're going to teach those social and emotional skills. So just like with rhyming, we're going to use literature, puppets, songs, games. We're going to plan it intentionally in our circle time. You have a handout of some songs in your packet. We don't have time to sing them all, so you're going to get to take them back to your classroom on Monday. But we'll sing one of them together. It says social and emotional skills, songs, and poems. So you've got some poems and songs to integrate in your classroom. On the back, there's a feeling song. It's on the right-hand side of the page. We're going to sing that together. It's to the tune of Twinkle, Twinkle. All right, we'll sing it together on the count of three. One, two, three. I have feelings you do too. That's a feeling to you too. I have feelings you do too. We just sing about a few. All right, so that's one song that you're going to be able to utilize. And of course, you can use uh, masks. You can have your children decorate faces with feelings. There's some great things for you to check out up here. I'll highlight some of them as we're going through. But after we're done, feel free to come up and touch and see. There's books regarding, to, regarding social and emotional development over on the right. You also have a list of some social and emotional literature in your packet. And then there's also some feelings masks, so you can have your kids have these pictures themselves, make them themselves, so you can, and we'll talk more about labeling emotions, so you can utilize those with that song and some of those uh, songs and poems that you have on that handout. Moving on, the social skills that we're going to talk about today are self-awareness, interactions with peers, group participation, and problem solving. Problem solving is a big one for our little ones, right? For self-awareness, there's the objectives there. We want our 48-month-old children to describe their physical characteristics, behavior, and abilities positively. And we want our 60-month-old children to compare their characteristics with those of others and display a growing awareness of their psychological characteristics, such as thought and feelings. So that's one of the social standards that we're working towards. It begins with the children's self, and since they love themselves, they will love any of these projects that you do that help them identify those. This is one art project you can do. It's a mobile where you can have the parents bring in pictures of the child from the time they were born till they are in your classroom. Have you ever heard a four-year-old say, when I was little, this is what I did. I love that statement, right? Or a two-year-old even better. When I was little, 
Um, we also, if we work at a Christian school, we want the children to be able to identify, of course, that they are made by Christ and in his image and um, to understand his love for them. So anytime, again, you can incorporate that biblical integration into your classroom decor and your art projects so they can identify what their name is and then what they like to do. So that's how they're going to meet that objective, that learning standard. There's also bulletin boards where you can say mirror, mirror on the wall. We are special one and all. And you have the children identify something they can do. So they're having that positive attribute and identifying something positive about themselves. Moving on to still under social interactions, looking at those interactions with peers, we want children to be able to participate in simple sequences of pretend play and then to create more complex sequences of pretend play that involve planning, coordination of roles, and cooperation when they're 60 months. Um, again, play is so important in our early childhood classrooms and settings. This quote from Nacy says, play is an important vehicle for developing self-regulation as well as promoting language, cognition, and social competence. So again, being able to inform parents of how important play is in the classroom. I also love this quote. Albert Einstein said that play is the highest form of research. So you guys are raising and budding young scientists anytime you play with then. Good job. Some of the ways we can help our children develop play skills are, of course, dramatic play schemes in our classroom. You can create a home center, restaurant, school. The kids love playing school, and they love playing teacher, right? Um, have a tea party. That's a really social, interactive play scheme. How many of you have dramatic play corners or sections in your classroom? Yes. If not, if you don't have a space specific for that, like I said, we dealt with very small classrooms in our school. So we would create portable dramatic play schemes and just have boxes that we could bring in and rotate between the teachers. For block play, block play is also a huge issue where sometimes we see those lack of social skills, right? Throwing of blocks, does anyone see that? Fighting over blocks. One of the ways we can make block play successful is provide materials to make it a play scheme. So really being intentional about the opportunities that we're gonna provide for the children. So instead of just being open-ended, which at times we want to do, but in order to extend that play for the children and make sure they're really working on those interactive experience with their peers, you can provide things um, props to make a city or to make a farm. And when you're sitting and playing with the children, you're really able to model strategies like sharing, taking turns, asking to join and play. So anytime that you're on the ground, in the trenches with your kids, you're able to really model those social skills. And we'll talk a little bit more about those problem solving strategies in just a second. Another way you can integrate play in your classroom is by doing a pretend city. Um, I'll provide you with the information online on the layout of how we did this at our school. But we did not do field trips at our school, so we turned our classrooms into a pretend city. If you do field trips, even better, get out in the community. We just didn't have the ability to do that. So we transformed our classrooms into different community environments. Um, we did a grocery store. There's a veterinarian office. So great opportunities. And you guys will get the list of resources and how to set this up within your school. The students would rotate between classrooms. So every teacher was only responsible for creating one environment. But your children got to go through maybe six or seven environments. And it was so cool to see how writing skills could be integrated. But more importantly than those academic concepts, it was great to see the children cooperating with each other, learning what the rules of that um, community community were and figuring out how to relate with one another. All right, real quickly, who has some activities, games, or materials that you have in your classroom? What do you do to encourage cooperative play within your classroom? There's some great things that we have in early childhood classrooms. We'll take maybe just three for the sake of time. What are some things that you already have in your classroom that you can use that will help the children work as a group? Anyone? Yes. Puzzles, yes. Table puzzles or even floor puzzles, those are great ways to get the children working with each other. Anyone else have another one? Magnetiles, those are great. How do you use them to produce cooperative play? Awesome, okay, perfect. Anyone else have one more? Yes, in the back. 
Legos, Legos are another great way. Sometimes can be a social skills hotspot, right? So we'll talk about problem solving in our Legos area. But Legos are a great way to get the kids to work cooperatively. Um, another thing is parachutes. Parachute play is a great way because you're all working as a group to get the parachute either moving up or down. It's also really good for their listening skills, which is important. Moving on into group participation, we want the children to be able to participate in group activities and understand social expectations, group rules, and roles. Does that sound amazing for your classroom if your kids could do that? They understood those social expectations, rules, and roles. And also we want them to positively and cooperatively work as a group. There's some great practical ways to do that. One of the ways in your classroom you can foster that group participation for social skills is helper charts where the children feel like they're all a part of the classroom community. We'll talk about problem solving in a minute, but I saw a, a helper chart in a classroom that I recently visited where problem solver was one of the helpers on the helper chart. And so if the children had a problem, they would go to the problem solver helper to get the cards that I'm gonna show you in just a little bit. So I thought that was a great way to get the children integrated in that group participation. Another way for them to figure out social rules and expectations is thumbs up, thumbs down. We're gonna do that together real quickly. Um, so this is the link for this free printout for this thumbs up, thumbs down jar that you can make for your classrooms. And it just has strips of different social behaviors that take place in the classroom. The kids can decide whether it's a thumbs up behavior or a thumbs down behavior. And there's blank ones for you to write your own on. But I love that idea of also it being a visual cue for later throughout the day to show children, is that a thumbs up behavior or is that a thumbs down behavior? Let me see what looks thumbs up. It's a really good visual and verbal cue for the kids. So let's do it together. All right, first one, helping clean up when the song comes on. Is that thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up, yeah. How about sharing the swings? That was a big thing for us, thumbs up, sharing the swings. All right, how about throwing books? Is that thumbs up or thumbs down? That's thumbs down. All right, how about helping a friend who fell down? Thumbs up, very good. So again, we're gonna take the opportunity to talk about these circumstances before they happen in the moment and really intentionally teach the children about why that's a thumbs up, how does it make you feel when that happens, or why it's a thumbs down. To get them moving and grooving and active, and so you guys can do that too. Real quickly, can I have one volunteer? On each of your tables, there should be some picture cards. And in the front of the room, I've placed a thumbs up bucket and a thumbs down bucket. And my teacher tip for this is use Velcro on the front of buckets, and then you can change the concepts. So if you're doing letter recognition and you want to give pictures with that start with different letters, you can put a letter A and a letter B so they can run up and match it. So that's how you can utilize these because I didn't have a lot of storage in my classroom. So that's the teacher tip. All right, real quickly, one volunteer. We're going to see how fast you can run. Can you run up safely and carefully? And decide if your pictures are either thumbs up or thumbs down. On your mark, get set, go. Good job. All right, thanks guys. Let's give a round of applause to our brave volunteers. See, we're so encouraging. Say, good job, volunteers. Thank you. All right. So thumbs up. You guys will get access to these picture cards just so you have specific pictures to be able to teach to the children. All right. Is reading a book with your friend thumbs up or thumbs down? It is. Awesome. All right. How about fighting over a toy? Thumbs up or thumbs down? That's thumbs down. So we're going to talk about these with the children and teach to them, um, integrate them throughout the day. You'll get these picture cards, like I said, to be able to teach the children about whether these things are thumbs up or thumbs down. But we're going to move on for the sake of time. You'll also get links to some worksheets um, to help integrate it during your time with the children where they can indicate whether the behavior is, would make them happy or sad, and then whether the behavior is being kind to their friends or not kind to their friends. So they circle the happy face if it's kind, sad face if it's not kind, because kindness is kind of an abstract concept a little bit, right? So we wanna teach what 
does kindness look like in our classroom? Here's the worksheet where the children can write a happy face if it would make them feel happy or a sad face if it would make them feel sad, identifying those emotions in their children, in themselves, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other teacher tip I have that I always like to share, if you print worksheets on cardstock and then put them in sleeve protectors, you can write on them with a dry erase marker so you're not making a million copies because we didn't have a budget to do that. So in case your school doesn't, you can use them over over and over again with your children. All right, moving on to problem solving. So with social interaction 2.3, we want our children to be able to seek assistance in resolving peer conflict, especially when disagreements have escalated into physical aggression. And at 60 months, 60 months, we want our children to negotiate with each other and to seek adult assistance when needed. We also want them to increasingly use words to respond to conflict. So some of the ways we're going to work with problem solving with our kids is we are going to teach, practice, apply, and model. We're going to teach children what a problem is, identify it throughout the day for them. We're going to practice identifying solutions with them. We're going to apply problem solving strategies. And then we're going to model problem solving strategies with them throughout the day, identifying problems and solving them. One way you can do that, this is a really cool visual aid. If you want to give me five in the air, this is a high five way to problem solve. So first we need to cool down, and we'll talk about calming techniques in just a second. We're going to identify the problem, then we're going to brainstorm solutions, then we're going to go for it, and then we're going to follow up. The CCEFL website, which you have listed at the end of your PowerPoints, as well as in your additional handouts, there's a list of books and website resources. The Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning is a great website that's entirely dedicated to social and emotional foundations for early learning, just like the title says. They have tons of free resources, so I really encourage you to check out that website. We'll provide some links to the things that I'm referring to in this presentation, but this is their set of problem-solving cards. So they have a big set that you can print off to teach from during circle time, and then they have a little set that you can print off and put on binder clips and disperse throughout your classroom. So after you've taught the children how to look for solutions to problems, they, if they're old enough, can uh, prompt themselves and look for some solutions to problems. So some of the ways that they've identified you can solve a problem is you can get a teacher, you can ask nicely, you can ignore, you could play together, you could say please stop, you could say please, you could share, you could get a timer. In the middle of each of your tables, there should be a sand timer. Um, they're really inexpensive and great to put at, throughout your classroom. So you can buy them in one minute, two minute, three minute times. And that has been so great in helping children who have a really hard time sharing to give them a visual aid um, and a visual prompt of when they will get that toy back. Because it feels like the end of the world for them when we ask them to give that toy to someone else for some for some children, right? Has anyone ever seen that with a child? So having that timer helps them identify that they will get it back, they will get another turn. So it completely changed the sharing ability of some of the even children who had the hardest time sharing in our school. Um, so I encourage you to use those timers with the children. Another thing you can do is problematize. Can we all say that word, problematize? just a fancy long word for basically saying what the problem is throughout the day and identifying the solution. Again, really modeling for the children because we're going to make these skills all throughout a part, the parts of our day, right? We're not just going to teach them once and then walk away from them. Just like the concept of rhyming or reading, we're going to integrate it in everything we do. So for snack time, for example, you can say we have six friends and only two apples for snack. What can we do? So help them be able to identify or allow them to be able to identify what the problem is. So what's the problem here? Not enough. We don't have enough apples. What is a possible solution? What could we do? We could cut them. We could share them. Very good. You guys are brilliant problem solvers. <laughs> All right, moving into emotional skills. I think this is sometimes where we see even more difficulty with some of our children, really lacking the emotional skills and that brain readiness. 
um, to be able to participate with a group. So hopefully we'll have some practical strategies of things we can do to help them develop these skills. For the sake of today, we're going to talk about understanding emotions, so the emotional vocabulary and awareness, and then self-regulation and impulse control. I intentionally saved the best for last. Um, because I think that's a key component for some of our munchkins in our classrooms. Understanding emotions, just for the sake of time, I'll leave you with this to be able to read, but we want children to be able to identify people's feelings, to notice differences, and then for children to comprehend the psychological reasons people act the way they do. So we basically want them to build an emotional vocabulary. Some of the ways we can do that, post a feelings chart in your classroom. Um, I always recommend, too, making things down at kids' level where they can see it so they can really interact with it. Um, for emotions uh, charts, I saw one classroom where they took pictures of the actual kids in the classroom making different emotional faces and made that their emotions chart, which was so cool to see the actual kids in the classroom integrated in that. So can I see, because I want to make sure we all know have an emotional vocabulary, can I see your happy face real quickly? Oh, good. How about your sad face? Oh. How about a surprise face? <gasps> Very good. We should make an emotions poster with you guys. Um, another way we can build that vocabulary with our children is discuss the feelings and the physical signs of various emotions. So when we feel angry, what are some of the things that happens to our body when we feel angry or frustrated? Who can give me one? A physical sign of that. What is it? You tense up. Your body feels really tight. So teach your children that. When my body feels really tight, I'm feeling frustrated because I can't find the book that I wanted to share with you guys <laughs> or whatever the case may be. Um, model that for the children, but talk to them about, does your body ever feel tight and tense? And then we'll talk about calming strategies. What are some things we can do to make our body feel nice and loose? And again, that's helping get that oxygen to the brain. Another way you can help children identify their emotions is ask them to draw how they feel. So you can see maybe this is a, the one on the left is a little bit more of an older child, a little bit more advanced. They can draw happy, sad. How about the one on the right? Any guesses to how that child might have been feeling in that moment? Maybe frustrated, maybe angry. <laughs> So ask them to draw, and again, you're going to be supporting them through that process and asking them how they feel to help build that vocabulary. Up here, there's some other great tools. There's a social and emotional skills box that you can buy from Lakeshore, but what we would do is look on lakeshore.com and make it ourselves. Am I allowed to say that? Um, because we didn't always have a budget for things like that. So graduation bears that you can write on, you can make them happy or angry or sad. Um, you can provide those picture cue cards. You can easily print these types of things off online. And also the Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning has a free set. So the more you can integrate looking at feelings and what those emotions look like, you're going to help the children build that vocabulary for themselves. You also have your handout. Those are two of my former teachers singing with their munchkins. Um, you have that handout with songs and games to learn about that emotional vocabulary. Moving into self-regulation and impulse control. At 48 months, we want children to need adult guidance in managing their attention, feelings, and impulses, and show some effort for self-control. What I really appreciate about the preschool learning foundations and the fact that they're developmentally appropriate is they recognize that at 48 months, children are going to need adult guidance in managing their emotions, right? It's not realistic for us to expect that they are completely emotionally competent. Um, so I like that reminder. At 60 months, they should be able to regulate their attention, thoughts, and feelings, and impulses more consistently, although adult guidance is sometimes necessary. So again, that reminder of the role we serve in helping children develop impulse control. Here are some impulse control activities, some practical ways, because I think this is a skill that, again, we sometimes assume children walk into the classroom already having, or we look at it as a behavioral issue when they don't have impulse control, when somebody takes a block from them and they whack the other child. Um, we look at it as a behavioral issue, but 
after today, we're looking at it as a skill and a teachable opportunity. We're not going to allow for that type of behavior in our classroom, but we're going to teach and find out what's that child lacking in that circumstance that we can teach to. And for a lot of times with our behavioral issues, it is that impulse control and self-control. So the more we can provide these opportunities in our classrooms, the more we're developing and strengthening that ability in the in the kids. Red light, green light is a great impulse control because you have to run and then stop, which is hard to do. Simon Says is great impulse control, also works on that listening skills. Musical instruments, you can have the children play really, really loud and then have them play really, really soft. You can sing really loud and then sing really soft. That's all practicing that impulse control and self-control with them. Anytime they play games where they have to take turns like Candyland, shoots and ladders, it's impulse control because they have to stop and wait their turn. Um, anytime you do a cooking experience where they're mixing things and they don't get to eat it right away, but they have to wait a little bit or let someone else have a turn, that's developing impulse control. And then, of course, freeze dance is a great way to develop in con impulse control because we're making their bodies go, 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 and then stop. And I'm actually going to make your bodies do that right now, too, with a song. We're going to do the Hold Still song. Has anybody heard this song from Yo Gabba Gabba? We'll do just a quick minute of it for the sake of time. This is a great impulse control song. If everyone can stand up, please. Wiggle, 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 go. Wiggle, 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 stop. Let me see you hold still. Wiggle, 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 go. Wiggle, 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 go. Wiggle, 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 go. Wiggle, 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 stop. Hold still. Now you relaxingly settle down. All right, just for the sake of time, I'm going to allow you guys to sit down. But there you go. You got your wiggles out and worked on impulse control. So you can get that song from iTunes on your list of songs and games or songs and poems in your supplemental packet. There's some songs from iTunes that you can download or buy right away for heading into the classroom on Monday to work on some of these skills with your munchkins. All right, another part of that self-control and impulse control is the ability to calm down when we are at that state of frustration or maybe just being super duper active. Um, I think we see this a lot with kids when we see them frustrated or angry um, or sad. So these are great skills, again, that we're going to teach to rather than looking at it as a behavioral indicator. We're going to teach them some skills to help calm it down. One of the ways we're going to do that is take a deep breath and to make sure that children are taking an actual deep breath as opposed to a shallow deep breath because if you tell a three-year-old to take a deep breath, they go, <sighs> which actually isn't getting the oxygen and blood flow to the front of their brain, which is where we want it. Remember flipping our lid, we need our brain to be full of oxygen and blood to make sure it's fully functioning. So we're going to teach them to smell the flower and blow out the candle. Very good. Let's do that one more time. Smell the flower. Blow out the candle. Doesn't it just make you feel better and so much more calm? Counting to 10 is another great way that you can help calm children down. And again, as teachers, do we sometimes need to smell the flower and blow out the candle? Yes, and we can model that for them when we're getting frustrated in the classroom. I'm feeling my body tense up. I'm going to go to the hula hoop and smell the flower and blow out the candle. And again, with all of these strategies that we're utilizing, when we're including them in our circle time and talking about them throughout the day and then putting the resources out for them to apply them, it's a lot better than if they're in that angry, frustrated state is that the best time to teach them this new concept? 
Probably not, because they're not hearing us, right? They're nowhere near the front of their brain or their upstairs brain where they need to be. So we want to make sure that we're teaching these things before the issues arise and then applying them as they need to. Another calming technique, sensory bags on your tables. You guys have some stress balls. You can make these on your own if you um, aren't able to purchase them. You can do deflated balloons and fill them with rice or sand. Flour has a really cool consistency to it as well. Um, there's also calming bottles. Some of the tables you guys should have calming bottles or some water drop timers. Can you hold them up for us to see? So oil and water and glitter. You can have the kids just look at those and again model for them when I'm feeling frustrated when I look at a calming bottle it helps me relax and helps distract me. There's some great scripted stories that you can use on the Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning. We talked a little bit about literature and again there's some books up there for you to check out for stories to use in your classroom and you have an additional resource in your packet. But there's also some great scripted stories about what it might look like to get frustrated to help the kids identify with a character. So this is Tucker Turtle. He takes time to tuck and think. So Tucker Turtle is a terrific turtle. He likes to play with his friends at Wet Lake School. But sometimes things happen that can make Tucker really mad. When Tucker got mad, he used to hit, kick, or yell at his friends. <gasps> Let me see your surprise face. <gasps> That's not OK, right? His friends would get mad or upset when he hit, kicked, or yelled at them. Tucker now knows a new way to think like a turtle when he gets mad. He can stop and keep his hands, body, and yelling to himself. He can tuck inside his shell and take three deep breaths to calm down. And Tucker can think of a solution, so using those problem-solving cards or a way to make it better. Tucker's friends are happy when he plays nicely and keeps his body to himself. Friends also like it when Tucker uses nice words or has a teacher help him when he is upset. The end. Again, that's on the Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning. So great ways to print out. There's another scripted story called I Can Be a Super Friend. Um, I Can Use My Words. So you guys can check those out as well up on the table. Additionally, we talked a little bit earlier about forming those relationships with parents and obviously their role in helping their children gain social and emotional skills is going to be integral. So one of the ways we can help support parents support you in the classroom is a backpack series which is on challengingbehavior.org. You have that reference there and then you also have it in the back of your uh, handout with the additional resources. So this is a backpack series. It just sends home practical information for families about helping your child understand and recognize anger, helping your child comply with requests. So it gives them, it's not too long, which I like because parents are busy. How many of us are parents again? Or you are parents? I'm not yet. How many of you are parents again? Yeah. So you're busy. When, when somebody gives you a book maybe to read, it can seem daunting or overwhelming. So this is a nice practical set of ways that parents can help support you in the classroom. Also, uh, I forgot to mention when it came to building those relationships with parents and their support, Children's Home Society, if you're from Orange County, and I believe LA has a, an office as well, um, you can come up here and check out these resources that they provide for free to schools. They'll give you up to 200, and it's some developmental wheels where they'll tell you what stages of development children are at and ways that parents can help support that development and they include social and emotional skills development in there. They also have some great pamphlets, um, things like toilet teaching without tears, dealing with stress, positive discipline, when a child bites. So these are free from Children's Home Society. So definitely contact them if you just Google Children's Home Society. You'll see the link on their home page. There's also these three key websites I wanted to highlight for you from your page with additional resources because, again, we're going to make this into a really fun, interactive eight-hour workshop where we can spend more time delving into these eventually. But in the meantime, here's some resources for you to check out. On the Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for Early Learning, one quick thing I wanted to mention is they have a book nook. So they take 
children's literature that you're likely to have in your classroom, and they write lesson plans designed entirely to target social and emotional skills. So they'll use a lot of the strategies that we talked about and some additional, so they'll help you integrate social and emotional skills in your phonics time, reading time, art time, math time, center play, and they've done it all for you in lots of great detailed lesson plans, and these are all free. So definitely check out that Center for Social and Emotional Foundations for early learning as a great resource. Um, we're gonna do questions real quickly. Does anybody have any questions on index cards that they wanted to pass up for us to answer before I pass the mic over to David? Or you can raise your hand if you have a question. Or I'll be up here as well, so you can definitely come and let me know if you need anything. You have my email on your flyer as well. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, I wanted to just leave you before I bring David up with this bit of encouragement. On the back of your handout, you have a prayer for teachers. Uh, that's my prayer for you as you work with these precious young children and these families. I am so excited for the fact that God has called you into this field because I'm very passionate about young children and, um, and appreciate so much what you do on a daily basis. And I absolutely believe that you guys are superheroes. Raise your hand if you're a superhero. All right, so thank you so much for being superheroes for these children. Henry Brooks Adams says that a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. And I absolutely believe that for you. You are influencing the future. And I appreciate so much what you're doing to help these children develop those social and emotional competencies. If you need anything from me before David comes up um, at any point, definitely feel free to email me. And I hope to see you soon and come visit your classrooms. I'll bring up David Castillo from the School of Education. Thank you very much. Hey, let's give it up for Carly. Carly, thank you so much. I'd be clapping if I could clap. What a gift today has been for me. I'm a parent of a three-year-old and a 22-week-in-the-womb-year-old. Um, so, Carly, you've given me as a parent some great tips, and um, I know all of us have appreciated her. Uh, let's give her a round of applause again. Before you go... I wanted to just go over a few of the items that we have in the center of your page. Some of you, how many of you, this is your first time to Biola University ever? First time on your campus. Wow, that's so much fun to, for me to see as our recruiter and as our community relations guy. Um, thank you for giving us the honor of serving you this morning. Uh, we're just glad that you could join us today. On the center of your table, you have a little bit of a list of, actually it's a long list, of all of our programs. We are... Um, we host the undergraduate major of liberal studies, as well as we have master's programs here, as well as a whole slew of uh, credentials from CTC, and the early child permits that Dr. Vidaure mentioned earlier. All of those are listed here. Uh, if we can assist you in your own further education, we'd be happy to talk with you. And some of you, I know, have been um, talking with us already. If you want to fill out, let's say that's you. You know you want to come here today convinced you of it, uh, this green card here uh, is going to be your next step. You can fill this out right now. You can leave it with me, Dr. Hetzel, uh, Carly uh, can take these as well. Um, and if you don't have the time to do it, you can drop it in the mail. No need for a stamp. Uh, but let us know how we can serve you more. We have a whole bunch of these lectures uh, the rest of this calendar year, and we're beginning to work on what that looks like next year. As Dr. Hetzel mentioned, we have next month's October lecture on October 25th. It's going to be on uh, creating high-performing learners at at-risk schools. Free, once again, uh, we'd love to have you there. And same place that you signed up for today's seminar at education.biola.edu slash lecture. We'll get you to all there. And some of you have already signed up for that. Um, in November, on November 14th and 15th, Dr. Hetzel mentioned we're hosting the Justice, Spirituality, and Education Conference. That's this postcard here. And on the back is all the info on that day of Saturday uh, the 15th. So check out that. Um, there's a cost associated. There's a website that gives you all of the info on how to register there. Now, some of you might actually consider presenting there. And the last thing I have for you, if you want to know more about Biola uh, and those programs that I mentioned earlier, we want to invite you to an 
information session. That's the word I'm looking for, uh, which is going to be on October 18th. That's my anniversary, and I'm giving up the morning of my anniversary for you all. Um, so come celebrate my anniversary. Uh, I'll buy you breakfast, and you can sign up here. There's, there's a website here. Um, so that's what I have for you, but I want you to know, as a parent, as one that is deeply passionate about K-12, pre-12 education, thanks for what you're doing. Uh, thanks for giving up um, so much of your own life, the sacrifices that you make. Uh, as Carly mentioned, we're not in this for the pay. Uh, we're in it to be that eternal uh, changer, that, that life changer. So thank you for that, and um, may God bless the rest of your day. Thanks for being here with us. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.